on UVA Legends Podcast, I have Shannon Nash, CFO of Wing. Um, Shannon is also award, she has produced an award-winning uh, documentary on autism. Um, just an, an amazing record. Uh, Shannon, great to see you again. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. Well, I want to go through your biography and I'm going to have to cut it short a little bit because otherwise <laughs> we're not going to have, we're not going to have time for anything else today. Um, okay. I, I know you're from the DC area and uh, yeah. you're 1992 uh, uh, graduate of the UVA's comm school and a 95 graduate of law school. So like, like me, you are a double who. Um, I know you started out, uh, I believe with K KPMG as your, in your career, or at least soon after, and you worked for Kale, Kano Gates and uh, Cooley, um, probably with my friend, Mike Mike Lincoln at some point. Oh, I um, love Mike Lincoln, absolutely. He, yeah, he, was my, he, was, he was my class at, yeah. uh, at UVA. Um, and then you worked um, for Am Amgen, Amgen out in Thousand, Thousand Oaks and then um, and then Switzerland, which is fascinating, I'm sure. Um, then you worked for the great uh, Debbie Allen uh, uh, Dance Academy, I believe it's called, but you were executive director um, and definitely got to know whether you ever met Norm Nixon, one of my boyhood heroes. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was great. Yeah. Then you were GC uh, at Registered Let, Let in Atlanta, CFO at Sunseeker Media. Uh, then you were uh, COO of Aspire Public Schools. Uh, you were for Cumulus Media and um, we're still on the West Coast in San Francisco. Um, uh, Inside Source, uh, CFO, uh, Reputation, uh, uh, CFO, also, uh, Chief Accounting Officer, and then also Chief Financial Officer. And then your present job at Wing, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you produced uh, two documentaries, um, one called Color My Mind, um, about uh, autism and uh, particularly about uh, how it affects people of, of color. And won an award at Cannes Film Festival, which is obviously amazing. I believe another passion of yours, uh, and Tisha Campbell uh, from Martin fame, uh, was is in that with you, I believe. Yeah. And then um, um, I, I believe you're working on now, or maybe you finished another one on board about uh, board membership. Uh, so did I get did I get most of that that right, Shannon? Yeah, I think we're done. Okay. Right? okay. It was nice talking to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well I, I, I thought I'd first start by uh, talking about social media. Now, you do incredible social media. I've I followed your career on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, I, knew, I think we met a few times. We didn't know you well, but I feel like I've known you because I've been able to follow it, your career. And it's, you know, obviously it's it's amazing. Um, how important do you think? And Mike Lincoln was another guy who was early advocate of LinkedIn and Facebook. Yeah. Learned, I learned that from him. Um, how important to your your career has it been your your social media outreach, your visibility, uh, and and also in in the future to young to young would be executives, what is social media going to do for them? Yeah, I think I think for me, when I started um, understanding the the power of storytelling, telling your own story, um, and really. Um, engaging in that, um, which, you know, I think early in my career, it was really about just people will notice me as long as I just do good work, they will notice me. And that's actually not the case. In most instances, you have to do a lot of self advocating. I think for me, when that became something that I actually was cognizant of was, was when I worked for Debbie Allen, because up to that point, I think I, I worked in really big organizations where that's just not something that's cultivated. And then I get over to, to Debbie Allen and it's completely the op opposite. It's like, you need to sell yourself. She's obviously very good at that. And she's a good supporter and mentor. And so I learned a lot about, I would say it started when I went over to Dada, um, Debbie Allen's organization. And then I think once I started working more in media and entertainment, I, I just saw how people did it successfully. So I would say that that's kind of where it it started. And then by the time I became a CFO, and specifically when I worked for reputation.com, which is a reputation software management system, which is all about brands protecting their reputation and, and using their reputation as a differentiator, right, in terms of how they compete in the market, there was definitely like on the corporate side that that it just further unlocked for me, like, how you should be using these mediums. Obviously, I lived in the Bay Area, so a lot of the ones you named that were very familiar to me, plus other mediums that 
people don't know about, I started to really use. And so I'm at the place now where I had somebody say, I saw them at an event and they were like, oh my gosh, I thought you were. And they named the city because I just saw on LinkedIn. And I said, well, first of all, I never post in real time. So if I'm somewhere, unless you tag me and a lot, sometimes I ask people don't tag me because I don't post in real time. I, I stagger it on purpose for a whole host of reasons, but I, it's at the point now where I think people I've built this brand for, for better or for worse and <laughs> has, um, really helped me in telling my own story and advocating for myself. And so I always advise, um, you know, people who are starting their careers, think about what you want to be known for and start building your brand and have the people around you who are your supporters amplify your brand. And so that's one of the things that I, I've been trying to teach and instill in, in younger professionals for sure. Yeah. Well, you do an amazing job at it. Um, you know, kind of, kind of going in reverse here. One thing that you've, I, you, you're on too many boards to mention uh, you, you are, you are a, a serial board member. And um, I, I believe your, your movie about uh, board membership, I, I listened to one of your interviews and you basically found when you were trying to become, get into boards at the same 18, 19 people, I think maybe it's African-American women, or maybe I, I forgot exactly how you phrase it. We're getting all the, all the key board memberships and you wanted to kind of uh, find out, uh, you know, how that works. So you, you began to pursue board membership. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I talked, I talked to uh, Yvette Sadler uh, the other day and she's done quite well with investment software and, and stuff. And we talked about how, you know, my generation, you know, African Americans. My dad was a military officer. My mother was a Navy secretary, and that's kind of like the first generation of African Americans that could that can have a white collar career and um, and can have some success. Now, obviously, there, there's been black entrepreneurs forever, but it was definitely a different time. Um, you know, board membership was something we didn't know anything about. I mean, I, we're just trying to have a good job. You know, build retirement, right. build money, buy your house. So, what? Why is board membership so important, and what does board membership provide? Um, not only to the company, but but to your own growth. Yeah. I, so so what you're referencing is the movie is called On Board, and it it tells the story of the first African American woman who got on a public company board. And to be clear, I'm, we're focusing on public companies, and her name is Patricia Roberts Harris, and she got on IBM's board back in 1971. Wow. And so it was important to tell that history um, because. At the time before we made the movie, we actually just uh, uh, a group of us uh, that are part of an organization called Black Women on Boards um, were together at a retreat, if you will. And we looked that up and we got the name of someone from Google that was not Patricia Roberts Harris. And just so happened, um, my husband and I happened to be at dinner with um, our mentor and his wife. His name is Barry Williams. He's been on like 14 public company boards, really well known as a corporate director. And I told him, hey, we're gonna do this film. We're gonna honor this person who's the first black woman to be on a board. And he was like, well, Google's wrong because she's not the first. And I knew we had to make a movie then because if your history is wrong on the internet, who's going to change that history? Mm -hmm. Like we don't learn about boards in school. Um, I happened to be fortunate to learn about uh, a board and I still didn't know what it meant, but very fortunate. And Fudge came to UVA when I was there. And I think at the time she was maybe like president of Sara Lee or something like that. Um, and I'd never seen a black woman in like that, like you said, a white collar job that high up. Never, I had never seen that, even though I grew up in DC and saw a lot of black excellence. I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, she cemented that seed in my head that it's, it's something I might want to figure out and pursue. And so I think it, the movie is definitely about exposing people to what is a board? And there are people that actually look like you that are doing these things that come from completely different career paths. But the simplest thing I tell, especially like high school students and college students, is that the board's main job is to do, you know, the strategy of the company and hire and fire the CEO. And, and most people are like, oh, so they like I was aspiring to be the CEO. You mean there's somebody that the CEO answers to? And I'm like, yeah, the board. A lot of people don't know that aren't exposed to that. So that's one of the things we hope to do with this film is really normalize that these are career paths for people that look like you and I. Yeah. 
Well, you know, uh, one of the reasons why you're such a successful board member is because you've always had great jobs. And let's talk about your current job first. You're the CFO of Wing, and um, you guys use drones, I believe, to deliver packages. And between you and your husband, Bill Nash, he's doing automatic cars. There are only no jobs left. But but yeah. I, <laughs> so, but but but. but but, but, I, but I do understand that uh, you guys are affiliated with a, a Google company called, um, a, a Google related company, did I lose that? We are, so Wing is um, owned by Alphabet. Alphabet, Alphabet. Is, is basically, Alphabet is um, Google's owner. Um, so Google's tech is our sister company. Um, I had to explain that to my my mother a couple of times. So she just says Shannon works at Google. I don't know. I, did, I just let her go with it. But yeah, we are owned by uh, by Alphabet. So um, we're Alphabet's drone delivery company. Um, I I have to point out to people all the time that uh, drone delivery is real. It's not the Jetsons anymore. Um, Wing has been doing uh, commercial residential delivery since 2019. We um, we started in uh, three continents in the in the U.S. We started um, in Christiansburg, which is Blacksburg, which is a partnership with the other Virginia school. Um, <laughs> we started there. And then uh, we are, uh, also started in Australia. We did a lot of our deliveries in Australia, done over 350,000 deliveries and continue to expand in Aust Australia with DoorDash. Um, and in the U.S., we have now started delivering in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with a partnership with Walmart. And we recently... Um, announced at CES, um, the com com uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. So the big show, we announced, um, Walmart announced that they're expanding with us in DFW. So by the end of the year, we will be reaching millions of people with our drone delivery. And, you know, you have to see it. I, I encourage people to go to our YouTube page. You have to see the delivery to really under understand how it works and that it's not science fiction. There's nobody with the joystick like looking at the drone and trying to like land it. Um, it is truly autonomous. And what I will tell you is that where we, um, where people live in a place where they can get drone delivery, there is, you know, a majority of people who are very favorable of it and actually would like to have it. And, and um, in fact, there's lots of people using it. I have a question for you. What do you think the number one thing that people order um, from for drone delivery? Food. And it's by far number one. Food. Not even close. What would you say? It's got to be food. Let's bring it down and not, okay. You're in the right. You're in the right um, hemisphere. Oh, al alcohol. Down. Alcohol. So alcohol, I think people would do, but there's other uh, requirements oh, sure. for one to deliver alcohol, right? There's you know age requirements. So this is any age could order this. Okay, uh, I'd say uh, milk. No. Um, oh, God. You know, I'm supposed to ask the questions here. Okay, I'll give it to you. <laughs> I'll give it to you. Uh, it's coffee. Oh, uh, that shit. I drink coffee. Yeah. Should, right. You drink it every day. It's, I should have said something you most people drink every day. I was Are close to alcohol. Was you, close. Were, <laughs> you were close. The drones, um, you know, our fastest delivery um, is just under three minutes. Um, we're talking the coffee is hot, it's not spilling. It's one of those things where um, I wish I had that. I wish I could order my coffee right now. I'm taking a car that weighs, you know, however, like thousands of pounds, um, especially if you're driving a truck. I'm driving 10 minutes and I'm driving back 10 minutes on a daily basis. There's so many positives besides just cost reductions, right, um, to being able to what we're trying to do is match the delivery with the use case. Like we're not trying to upend delivery in terms of like, you're never going to get your um, your refrigerator delivered by drone. We're talking about the, the millions of small packages that people get every day. Why are we using big trucks to deliver that? It is annoying for me to come home, especially when my, I have three sons, but two of them are now adults. But when everybody lived here, coming home to all those boxes, like daily, because it's just a free for all in terms of how people order. Um, and you'd open the box and it would be like, a tube of something or whatever. You're like, all oh, this packaging is just so wasteful for the environment. It's so, um, why do we have, a, why are we being so um, inefficient? So that is what Wing's you know, sole mission is, is to really uh, deliver these small packages in the most cost efficient, most environmentally efficient way. And it's fast. Yeah. Well, that seems to me, it can't miss, but uh, well, you know, one thing I, I have to say, I admire you and, and your husband is 
you found you are in uh, industries that are current. I mean, you can't be more current than what you're doing and what your husband are doing. It's, it's all people talk about. Personally, like you, I'm a lawyer and I sell to law firms. I, you know, e-discovery, legal staff, and been doing it for like 25 years. And when we first started, I was on a startup, one of the first companies almost invent man, uh, outs outsource managed review. Now, all this just, we worry the AI is gonna, is gonna you know, ruin our industry. We, we, we spend most of our time you know, you know, worried about things. And you know, obviously we just do the sales and do the same blocking and tackling that we've always done. And, and things are you know, normally gonna be fine. But, but it is interesting that you guys found these hot industries. Is that, is that something that you guys do on purpose? Do you guys look for where, where the activity is? You know, uh, and I've, I've listened to enough of these things. Shout out to Lisa Lawson. Sorry, Lisa Hamilton. I know her as Lisa Lawson. I listened to hers and I was like, why does Julian need to interview me? Lisa's story is like amazing. I love Lisa. Um, <laughs> I agree with what she said on her podcast, which like it seems like when you look back at it, like, oh, this is all destined and planned. It was not. Like you kind of just happen into to these things that, um, you know, they line up with your passion. They line up with, with what makes it interesting for you to get out of bed every morning. So I wouldn't say that it was something that I, I saw out that would be disingenuous. I think it was just that when the opportunity became available and I thought about what was really interesting to me, it all lined up for me, right? And so I think it's just more of that than anything else because quite frankly, and uh, I think Lisa was talking about the vertical moves. I think I did <laughs> all of the above. Forward moves, vertical, backwards. There was a whole bunch of moves that happen in a career summer because just, you know, the organization, some are culture, some are you, some is your personal life. But when it all comes together, it's it's pretty amazing. And so I, I would say definitely we followed a lot of our passions. I mean, look, we we moved from all of our family and friends very early on in our careers and marriage. And that's probably the thing that ties us the most is that we were willing to go after different opportunities, even if that meant, you know, upending our like our lives and and going somewhere where you don't know anybody and having to start all over again. Yeah. Well, you know, you you had this you know incredible career as a financial executive, and you've done many different industries. I mean, so you've you've been able to to do the the books for no matter what um, uh, what the industry is. Um, is is are all financial executives? If if you're a talented financial executive. Does it matter what industry you're in, or are some particularly suited for the for the type of business it is? is it, or does it matter? If, if you're good at it, you'll be able to catch on, and you don't necessarily need any, any experience in that industry. I think it depends. I think it depends on on the industry. Some industries, the the finance function is more operational in nature, and those are the industries and the roles that I tend to be more attracted to. Like you said, starting as an attorney. And having that like personal, you know, services mindset, I think is very attractive for certain industries, other industries, not so much. And so I think that it really, it definitely does really depend um, on the industry. I've been personally attracted to tech, media, entertainment, like those type of industries. But, uh, but I've also gotten quite a, quite a big experience in manufacturing. I mean, one of the, the my first big corporate jobs is Amgen, manufacturer biologics. So you have to really understand a lot about supply chain and just that manufacturing ecosystem. I've, I've also, I'm also attracted to those industries, which, you know, for some may seem like it doesn't like kind of fit. Um, but when you think about what I do today, we manufacture planes and then we provide a service. So having both kind of experiences in my career was super, is, is super helpful, continues to be very helpful for purposes of operating this type of business. Sure. Do you think you would have been fulfilled if you spend a career at one organization? Like you, you uh, your resume is very similar to Yvette Sadler's and that Yvette yeah. has spent a lot of time at many uh, different financial giants, your, your, your different industries. But um, do you think you would have been satisfied to spend the last 30 years at the same company and moving up to CFO? I don't know, because I, I don't think the reality is I, I didn't have a life that would afford the, me the ability to do so. When I first um got married. My husband was a submarine officer. He went to the Naval Academy. So you move. Also, that was a time where it, there certainly wasn't just because like you were doing well at a company. Um, you, there was no ability to do remote like working, not really. So it's hard to have that type of spouse with that type of career 
and you have the ability to be able to just move with your company throughout like the you know the the nation that that just wasn't something that was um you know accessible for for us is different for people now but you remember those times it was you know 30 almost 30 years ago the other thing i will say to you is that um when I had just family issues, when I had our, our first child, he eventually wound up being diagnosed as autistic. And that also means uh, for a lot of working parents that you've got to like adjust some things. And I had to adjust some things. And I can tell you, I think that companies have come a long way in terms of being supportive of people's you know, personal family situations. But at the time, in two, the early 2000s, I can just tell you it was a really hard to navigate um, climbing the corporate ladder. And I still think there are some companies and some people that are, have some of the, the issues I had back then. So I don't think it's gotten perfect, um, but it was hard to be able to navigate that on in the personal side and being able to give the job um, and the career what it needed. And so the, that's what I say to you is I just don't think that based off of who I was, there was a company that would have been accommodating for all of that. And so a lot of the job changes were to accommodate personal life. And, and at a certain point in my life, I knew I didn't really want to practice law. And so then I had to figure out how to accommodate that because people would see in the beginning my resume and be like, oh, okay, so you want to go in the legal team. You want to be a GC. And I'm like, no, I'm interviewing for this job over in the finance team. And they're scratching their head because I didn't fit a box. Mm. Um, and that's why I mean by sometimes like if you really have a passion, you, you may have to take a step backwards and be overqualified for something just to get that experience. So you fit inside somebody's box to have the next opportunity. Yeah. Well, you mentioned law school. How, how important to your success has law school been? I mean, obviously it got you some really nice jobs, but uh, was it important to being a successful financial executive to be to be a lawyer as well? Well, I will tell you this. I do think that the thing that you learn in law school, especially, uh, you know, a lawyer, the whole just Socratic method and being able to critically think and think on top of your feet, a big part of your job as an executive is not to be the smartest person in the room. It's, the, it's really to be, are you able to critically think, especially being on a board, are you able to issue spot? Are you able to come up with like strategic ways to approach the problem, even though as a board member, your job isn't to fix the problem, right? Your job is to help that executive, you know, think through whiteboard, if you will, all of the various scenarios and come up with some potential pathways and to be helpful in that way. So I, I would say absolutely having um, gone to law school and even practiced um, is critical really for me to even have that mindset. In fact, I tell younger people, including I have a, um, a second year now at UVA oh, and he, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, he, I don't think he wants to be a lawyer or anything like that. And especially what he tells me he wants to do, but I have said to him, you should, based on what some of the things he's saying, I'm like, you should consider getting the legal degree itself, because I think it will help with what you want to do in your career and most people that I know that are recovering lawyers, as we like to say, they may like regret, I don't know how much money they spent for law school and all of that type of stuff. But I've, I've, I've failed to meet um, someone who's really like, I hate how much I learned. I hate how much it helps me, you know, critically think it's, it's, that's not what they don't like about practicing law. That part was good. Yeah. I, I'm kind of like you. I, I love the experience I, that I gained in law school with friends I made uh, such as Mike and um, but also when I watch the news and you know, you're talking about the Supreme Court or whatever, I, I kind of understand things better just for, for those right. uh, three years. And, and, you know, Charlottesville, as your son's finding out, is a, is a wonderful place. So, you know, you know it's yeah. been great. What, what, it, is, it is after we've graduated. I got to tell you, though, but I mean, I was there for seven years. By year seven, I was done with Charlottesville. I was like, this I was, is a lot. <laughs> I, I was too. I, I was too. Well, we're, 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 we're going we're gonna to get to that. Uh, what, what about practicing law did you not like? Why, why didn't it work out with you in law? And, and look, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize you because um, we're in the same, we're in the same boat. <laughs> so I, I found myself, so I did, like Lisa, I, I came into law as a, as a tax lawyer. Mm -hmm. Then I got into corporate law. And what I found myself being more interested um, uh, about in terms of like when we would be working with clients, um, let's say we were working on an M&A deal. I found myself being less interested in like drafting the agreements and more interested in trying to understand the numbers and why this made good financial sense for this M&A deal to happen. 
Like I was way more interested in hearing like the CFO talk than the general counsel talk. And that was a, a huge kind of aha moment. And then I went in house and it just further underscored that I was more interested in, in hearing what the finance team was working on and what they were doing and how they were really making decisions um, about you know areas that the company would go in. Um, for example, we wound up um, uh, going to um, Europe and expanding and I, I wound up being an expat and working um, over in Switzerland and many countries um, in, in Europe. And that was, expanding into a new market also was like being a startup inside of a big company because there's only a few people over there that you're working with, you're a small office, yet you're doing like 10 jobs, right? Because you're trying to get into new markets. And so that was interesting to me. I didn't, but, but everything else that the lawyers did was not interesting to me. It was like, oh, but you have to then paper all of this. I don't want to paper it. I just wanted to like <laughs> come up with the strategy and like model out. Like I, I found myself really excited about like modeling, right. From an FP and a standpoint, but that wasn't my job. Yeah. And so at some point it was very clear to me, I needed to make a, a switch. Hence the fork in the road. That wasn't necessarily a fork that went up. <laughs> yeah. Not at first. Yeah. Well, well, you mentioned you're going to Switzerland. At one point, I was president of a company that was owned uh, by Ronstadt, a Dutch company. And it was interesting dealing with uh, European business people. Uh, they, they have a much different sensibility um, than Americans. Maybe I shouldn't uh, stereotype all Europeans. But I, I, I imagine being a, a, a Black woman at the time, lawyer in, in Switzerland. Uh, how were you received in Switzerland? Um, were, were, were you, did you stand out? Were you different? Was there a lot of uh, African-American or are black women, women of color lawyers? No, there was not. Um, uh, I don't know if I know any when I was there. I don't wow. know if I can name one. Um, but this is what I will say. And, I, and I, 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 at first it was actually surprising to me. My experience is that people cared more about nationality than, than your color. And so many times I would go into a store or wherever and they would see me and then, you know, I would say, excuse me, blah, 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 blah. And you could see the like, them thinking like, oh my gosh, she's American. And I've had, and I had people say, oh, you're American. And I'm like, well, what did you think I was? And they're like, well, I thought you were African. And I'm like, I mean, I'm African American. I think the first time somebody actually said that to me in a store, they were like, oh, American. And I said, oh no, I'm black. Mm -hmm. They were totally confused by me saying, oh no, I'm black. They were like, Huh? Yeah. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm not in the U.S. anymore. They don't see it. Just, it's different. <laughs> yeah. They just they just want to know my nationality because that's somehow very important over here. Mm -hmm. And I will definitely say that, you know, I could see why this is, you know, there's the Tina Turner. There's the Josephine. Uh, uh, what's Baker. her name? Just Josephine Just Baker. Baker. Thank you. <laughs> Josephine Baker for the world where why they stayed, because I can tell you that I definitely um felt uh i didn't feel i felt a, i felt fine i felt great actually in the parts of europe that i was in mm -hmm. and it was the first time maybe in that i was cognizant of the fact that like people weren't as much looking at me as oh you're a black person not 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 as much yeah well you, you remind me of an interesting interesting story well i, I think it's a, i think it's a funny story um when I, when I was in Holland with, with my son, um, you know, in America, when you see African-American on, on the street, especially in an area where that's not all, all black, um, you always speak or at least nod your head. It's normal. And if you don't do it, it's really rude. Well, in Holland, I would do that because it's normal. And then people were surprised by that because uh, the people of color in Holland don't do that. That's not part of their code. And I remember I, I, I told one of my Dutch friends this. He's a white guy. He was so offended by that tradition. Now, why would you speak to uh, blacks but not white? Like, it just makes any sense. I just, it, was, right. it, was, it was too complicated to explain. So, um, so I, I stopped trying. So look, I know, you, I know you came back to America and you got into um, uh, working with Debbie Allen. And I think that brought up some of your creative side that you mentioned. And that kind of led to the fact that you got involved in movies. Now, t talk a little bit about how you, uh, how you, uh, how color colored my mind came to be. Now, this is a movie that I mean w won a uh, award at the Cannes Film Festival, which I think is one of the best, uh, most prestigious film festivals in the world. So, tell us about why you decided to do that project, and tell us about the project. <laughs> 
Yeah, it won at the, the they have these pavilions and so they have something called the American Pavilion. So that's where we won, okay. which is was amazing. We we're on a yacht. Like it's, it, it was an out of body experience. I can we'll take that. Yeah. We'll yeah. take it. Um, it came about um, because I had I was I was involved with a lot of organizations that were helping um, families with autistic kids. And I um, also was just really active in going to find any and every therapy I could to try to help my kid. And what would happen is you'd go to these therapies and either you were the only person of color there or it was the same, like two or three of you every single time. And what I, I completely knew was that there was clearly more people of color who were dealing with raising and trying to get therapies for their child on the spectrum. But I was trying to figure out why they weren't like at these places that I was going to, especially because at that point I live in the state of California and the state has poured in lots of money to um, a lot of these therapies were free. So this was like not a socioeconomic issue. This was just, to me, an issue of lack of access or education about the free programs. So why is that? And then there was this study that was done around the time that showed that Black and Latino kids were diagnosed something like five years after their white counterparts. And why that's important is early diagnosis really can make a difference in terms of the trajectory of like that child's learning and life and et cetera. And so there's a, a push to try to get as much of the therapies as you can between the ages of like whatever, 18 months to like, you know, seven, eight years old. Like, it, like time is not on your side as the brain is developing. And so one, um, one evening I was at a friend's house and my son had a therapy and it hadn't gone well. And I was just I was working and it was just a really stressful day. And I remember everybody was like at the, the party and the cocktail. And I went out into the, the courtyard and um, was just crying. I mean, it was just like a stressful, stressful day. And this woman came out and she was like, what's wrong? And I was like, I don't want to talk about it. And she's like, let's, you know, I'm going to sit here and pray for you. Cause that's who she, she's such a kind soul. And so then I just start blabbing about what's going on. And then when I finished, she was like, Oh, that's what's wrong. She's like, I got you. My son's autistic too. This is a black woman. Um, and we started talking about like, how had we never discussed this? And you're not alone. And why do you feel alone? And I'm here for you. And I'm then, and so the more we started talking, the more we were like, well, wait a minute, we've known each other for a while. We had never discussed this. We'd never um, had really, um, I couldn't tell her son was on the spectrum. She didn't really know my son was on the spectrum. That's the other thing about being on the spectrum. Sometimes people, a lot of times you can't tell. And then it's like when the kid's just acting weird and what's that about? And so we just started talking more and more about what can we do to maybe form a support group or whatever. She had some friends, I had some friends. And the next thing you know, um, LaDonna Hughley, who I love deeply, who's DL's wife, and I were like, we're gonna make a film. And so, um, we both knew Tisha. We there's um, Ladonna has a friend named Donna Hunter who had a daughter on a spectrum, and then my friend Tammy McCrary, who's Shaka Khan's sister, mm -hmm. and we were going to all the therapy. Me and her were like therapy queens together. Um, we came together and said we should do something to really help give more exposure, hence storytelling, learn from Debbie, for the Black and Brown community about at least getting your child um, diagnosed because it can make a difference. And that's how it started. Well, and you know, it was obviously very successful. Um, you didn't seem to get a bug for that industry though. You, you, you did the project um, and you, you seemed yeah. to get away from movie making yeah. for a while and you, you helped finance that too. So you were all, you were yeah. all in. Yeah. And it wasn't until the, the, the current project that you got back into it. So what did you think about movie making? Did you, did you want it? Do you yeah, want to be I, part of it or is it another passion yeah. project? That you've come, yeah. or, so for me, I've made other movies for sure. Um, I'd worked I, at one point I was CFO of a media company. So I'd made, I mean, if you go to IMDb, there's a lot on there, oh, Okay. Yeah. but the ones for me personally are the passion projects. Like you said, like, do they like this, like on board our current movie where we are actually, um, on women's, um, uh, international women's day for women's history month, which is March 8th. We're doing a big, you know, splash about it. Like, for me, it's the passion projects that drive me because filmmaking is hard. You have to, just how you have to raise the money, how hard it is to get your film or your TV show distributed. It is hard, hard, hard work. And like you, I mean, 
Um, I'm not, you know, we practice, I'm not um, immune to hard work, but I mm -hmm. also know that I, I, I make good money. <laughs> I had hard work in other industries. This industry is, it, it, A, it's just harder to make good money for what I call good money, put it that way, for the amount of time that you put into it. I think that, um, I think that that's, you know, you, you saw the strikes that happened, et cetera. People have to fight for the money. And in my mind, it was like, I could actually make this a lot easier and not have to fight as much to like, you know, get paid. Um, unless it's your passion. I know people who, who have incredible careers and, and make lots of money. It is their passion though. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my passion. It was just something I knew how to do. And until mm -hmm. it became something I really cared about, I was like, I don't want to do this for a complete living. And so my husband's like, he jokes, he's like, every like four or five years, you're like, I have a passion and it's to make a film. He's like, and then you start making the film. You're like, oh, <sighs> doing this, <laughs> this is stressful. <laughs> well, with your experience, so what about other types of media, you know, like a podcast and other, other types of media? I mean, you're very talented, you're very photogenic and camera loves you. And and you and you actually you know how to do this. So you you put these yeah. projects together. Have you thought about other types of projects that, that could do maybe not as ambitious as a movie? Yeah, I think I think about it a, a lot. I think like two years ago I was like, I was gonna do a podcast, and then like I got on a board and I like ran out of time, right? So I was like, oh, I can't do that. Um, yeah, I think that when like the the passion strikes me, I'll probably do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I gotta be passionate about it. And today. I would say that I'm just super happy that you have your podcast and I can come on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let me do a little bit of the work this time. So, well, you know, let's, let's go back to your, uh, your DC days. Now I know, I know your father um, was a lawyer and it sounds like one of those success stories where he may have been one of the first um, in his, in his uh, family to either go to college or at least go to law school. And he went to Howard law school, very prestigious school. So tell us a little bit, a bit about your family and some of your influences. Yeah, no, you're right about that. My father, my, my mom and dad went to Michigan State. And um, when it's interesting, when they left Michigan State, so now they're armed with like teaching degrees and they moved back to, we're from a town called Saginaw, Michigan. It was a pivotal um, teaching moment for me even because my father, um, his family, my mom's family, everybody worked in the General Motors plant. And he went back to that same plant where everybody worked, cousins, aunties, uncles, play cousins, you name it, everybody works here. And um, he went back and he's like, I'm armed with my Michigan State degree. I want to get into the management training program. And, you know, the racism was just really bad in the sense that they were like, there's no opportunity for you degree in her degree. You can get back on that factory line like your whole family has been doing. And I watched my grandfathers like really work hard for years and like 30, 40 years later, they retire and you get like a watch. And so that was not like he was of a generation where he was like, no, 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 no. Like we should be doing something greater. And he only knew of a couple of law schools, which is so funny to me, no, you know, in terms of like just not having exposure. He knew that like the greatest lawyer he he um, admired and could think of was Thurgood Marshall. And he's like, Thurgood Marshall says Howard is amazing. I want to go to Howard. Didn't know anything else about it and just applied and my mother said, called the admission office every day and was like, did you get my application? Am I going to get in? So much so that my mom's like, I think they just let him in so he would stop calling them. Like, I don't, <laughs> I think they were just sick of him because he was just that determined to like prove everybody wrong. And it changed the whole trajectory of like an entire family. Um, the King family wound up, you know, many people uh, came down to Howard and went to school and so we're on like our third generation of lawyers, doctors, like it's crazy how it just changed an entire trajectory of a, of a family. And so that was a huge influence, obviously, for me as a as a young girl. Um, and one of the, my most proudest moments ever is um, at the time I'm practicing at K&L um, in DuPont Circle. And I remember my father meets me for lunch and he comes through the lobby and he's just standing there like kind of awestruck. And I'm like, and it's almost like he's, he's being very pensive, but like sad. And I'm like, what's wrong? Cause he's a pretty proud guy. And he was like, when I came here in the early seventies, the same building, like I, I came through the mail room and you just walk through the front door. Like it was no big deal. He's wow. like, I, this is amazing. Yeah. Well, what neighborhood did you, did you grow up in, in, in the DC area? 
Yeah, I grew up in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, my town was called, I lived in Alexandria for a while, Arlington, and then I went to high school in Annandale. You went to Annandale High School? Uh, I did. I didn't know that. I went to Robinson. How come I didn't know that? I don't know. I actually went to, it's actually even crazier. I went to Jefferson High School mm -hmm. for three years and, and, you know, they turned it into a magnet school. And so we were two schools within one. And I wouldn't even know my husband if it weren't for that experience because he should have, I think, gone to Vienna High School. Right. I think that's a high school. He probably was Mad yeah. Madison or Oakland. No, not Vienna High School. Oakland. Sorry. O Oakton. Oakton High School. Yes. He lived in Vienna. But he got bussed to Jefferson because he was in the high tech program and I was in, they called the low tech program, whatever that <laughs> means. And so we were two schools within one. And then my senior year, they kicked us out and they made us go to in. Yeah, this guy. So you probably were there, well, Ray Crittenden and, well, I know a lot Ray of- Ray Crittenden and I grew up together. He's like my brother. We lived across the street from each other. I've known yeah. him my whole life. You knew Ray? Well, I know of him. He was a great athlete. Yeah. I was older than yeah. you guys, but I watched him play sports. And yeah. you know, I, do, I do, I have um, Facebook groups for former Northern Virginia athletes. And we, we talk about Ray. Ray went all the way to the NFL and he, he can did. play soccer. He can do about anything. But they, yeah. then like Amanda Cromwell must have been about your year, who was a uh, mm -hmm. UCLA a women's coach and she was on the UVA soccer team. But you had so many great football and basketball yep. players at at, at uh, yeah. Andel about that time. What, what was your experience like? I guess you only had one year there, but um, do you have good memories of Jefferson and then Annandale? Oh yeah, both. Yeah, both. I mean, I, I mean, like the, the towns are so, I mean, the high schools are so close together. Like mm -hmm. I knew everybody at Annandale. Fun fact, um, I don't know if you remember Danielle Tut. She used to run track. Yeah, she went to UVA. Yeah. Um, so, so she was the one that I went to visit. She's a year older than me. So she's class of 91. She went down to UVA and I went to visit her for spring fling and it was over. Like it yeah. was over for me. Was I was good. like, I want to go where Danielle's going. That seems like a lot of fun. So yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, it sounds like my next question is why did you choose UVA? But it sounds like spring fling did its, did its spring job. Fling. Yeah. And, it uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned earlier that you had, uh, after seven years of Charlotte, Charlottesville, you had enough. And I was the same way. I love my time down there. But by the end of law school, I was, I had enough. So, but when you, when you first got, when you first got down there, uh, what was the adjustment like? For example, for me, I felt Charlottesville felt completely Southern to me uh, compared to Northern yeah. Virginia. And I also felt at, at Robinson, we had a small black, black population, maybe four or 5%. And we were really good friends, but, um, but you know, it was it, I, it seemed relatively progressive for the times. Like I had a lot of white friends, and I didn't think about race that much in high school. At UVA, I thought about it every day, and almost all my close friends were black. Um, what about you? What was your adjustment like to go from Annandale to UVA? Very similar. I mean, we grew up again growing. We grew up in Northern Virginia, so I thought I have a very similar experience to you. When I got down to UVA, it was like, oh look at these black people who are like me. Like, cause I, I'm used to being one of like two or three in a class. And now this just like, there's a lot of people like me. And I, I found myself, again, coming from Northern Virginia, you know a lot of people already your first year mm -hmm. um, just because either they went to your high school or they went to your middle school or you played sports against each other, whatever I knew. So I felt like I had like quite a few people I would see just walking the grounds. And I'd be like, oh, they'd be like, hey Shane, like I knew people. So it wasn't lonely in that way. It was just affirming to meet all of these like black people who had similar experiences to me in their environments. And now we had each other type of thing. So it, um, my first year was amazing. I was, I was in heaven because it just, um, although I still was friends, right. With people I knew from Northern Virginia, I started, um, developing these bonds with, um, you know, just people from everywhere that look like me. And so that book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting in the Cafeteria Together or whatever it's called, totally resonated with me because I finally felt like I had like a tribe that really looked like me type of thing. And it's interesting as um, you get into your major and all of those type of things, obviously I start having, you know, like I joined a business fraternity called Alpha Kappa Psi at the comm school. And you start having people, you know, all kinds of people from everywhere, all kinds of like nationalities. And so you get like a full experience by the time you leave. But, um, but yeah, it was super affirming to, to go down to UVA and find, and find my tribe. And the, th the thing that you talk about in terms of it being Southern, um, I actually don't know if I was that cognizant of that part of it. It wasn't until I went to law school to me 
quite frankly, that that became a lot more cognizant for me than my my undergrad years. I think I I probably insulated myself a little bit um, in my undergrad years and just A, didn't think about it, but B, I was around a lot of Black people. That's interesting. I think I had the opposite experience in, in law school. Yeah, uh, you know, we had I had tons of uh, African American friends in law school as well, and still friends to this day. Uh, it just was a tighter knit community. You got to know folks in your in your section, so there was more opportunities to get in depth, and things didn't seem seem as superficial. But I, I can I can see what you mean because there's a lot of insecurities. I'm going to law school that you have at undergrad, but they're kind of uh, exponential because of all the pressure of the Socratic method. And all yeah. those things, it just it just brings a lot of tension to to, to um, the, the air generally. But yeah. but I want I want to get back to uh, the undergrad. We'll get to law school. You uh, I you you pledge AKA. I think the not last not in undergrad. I pledged in grad school. You but you, you pledged in grad school. So uh, as I was talking with um, Yvette, um, you know, um, I I found that the Greek system at UVA um, was such an important part of our social life. Yeah. And I, I, like you, I didn't, I didn't pledge undergrad, but all, all the parties were centered around uh, one of the Greek organizations would take the bull by the horn and throw the party. Right. They had the formals that, that we, we all love to go to. Uh, we sat close to each other at, at games. Um, our, our whole social life was built around the Greek organization, Greek organizations. What was it? What were the, what were the effects the Greeks system had on you? And obviously, you know, when you pledged, um, what did you do to you then? Yeah, I, so it's interesting. I think you're 100 percent right. That was our a, a big part of our social outlet, and I think for for me, it was still about like just finding your tribe, finding your people, um, and and feeling like you belong right to something. And so in that way, you know, I think it was great. What is interesting to me, going back to Virginia, we both have second years now, and I was I talked to my son about it. It's different. It's, I mean, they, he is not experiencing what I feel like we experienced. I think that um, where, when it comes down to the fraternity sororities, when it comes down to the um, Office of African American Affairs, for example, um, I was a peer advisor and I love being a peer advisor. I'm still friends to this day to people that I was their peer advisor and my peer advisor, I'm still friends with her. Um, I, my son doesn't have a peer advisor. And at this point, doesn't even want one. And mm. I just, I mean, I mean, I, I, when he went to the picnic and you get connected with the peer advisor, he was like, yeah, this is just not for me. And I know several people's kids who have said the same thing, not to mention like the, 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 the hanging out at the bus stop and all that is like, it's just not a thing for him. Mm. I couldn't imagine that because it was a big part of the social fa fabric, going to the parties, going to the step shows was a big part of our social fabric. And I don't know what changed. But I'm not, and you know, at least I can give the experience that I'm seeing with my kid. I'm not seeing that that's a, a big part of like social life. Like I don't think he, when he graduates in, you know, whatever in four years, I don't think he'll look back and like have those memories. And that's kind of sad to me. You know, it's very interesting you, you say that because my son's having the same experience. So my, my, my son is biracial. And when he, when he went to UVA, uh, the black community was so welcoming to him and he, he made friends connections right away. And it was, it was great. But I, I, I just think the parties are different. They're usually, they're very, they're very rare and they're, they're off campus somewhere. Yeah. We, you know, we yeah. had a central location that either, I think when you were there, SAB, when I was there, more yeah. Newcomb or, yeah. or whatever, but, but there, yeah. we had parties, we had things that we could rely on. Um, you know, his, his social, like, you know, I hate to say this, I hope he's not listening, but I track him sometimes on, on, on fine friends. And I'm always like, you're always studying or in your room and I, you know, that's great. But I just felt like I had so much fun. And, and I, I tell him, I said, look, you're, you're going to have an opportunity to meet so many people now. And, you know, I, it doesn't really get that much better than what you're experiencing now. It, you know, you'll have more comfort le le later on in life and I, you really need to en embrace it. But I, I agree. I don't think they have those, that, that um, the opportunities to have that, that great social interaction yeah. that me and you had. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see it. But again, um, we didn't have social media. We didn't have like we didn't have TikTok. We didn't have those yeah. things that I think now are like proxies for, you know, some of that stuff. Like they communicate with each other in, in ways where, you know, we had to go to the party to see the person to do. They don't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> to show up. 
to show how old I am and I'm much older than you. We wanted to go see, we didn't have a, in our first year, we have a phone in our room because we were too cheap to pay for one. We had a pay phone downstairs. So if we wanted to go see someone and get together later on at night, we'd go knock on their door and if they weren't there. We had to leave a message on the door saying, oh, yeah. hey, meet us at Newcomb yeah. at, at, at 945. Yeah. No, I whatever. had that. Yeah, yeah, the little boards on people's yeah. doors. I had that, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. so yeah. I'm, not, I'm not that old. Or, oh, at least yeah. we're almost in the same gener uh, a generation yeah. here. Now, I, I assume you, you mentioned the pledge in the grad chapter. Um, and my, my guess is, and this is, if you don't want to, um, if it's getting too uh, personal, uh, was it hard to do all the prerequisites they needed to go uh, in comm school and to go online at the same time? Was that, was that too much? Is that why you waited? Or did you just feel that the time was right for you? Yeah, that's a, it's a hard, that's a hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I would probably say there was just a lot of dynamics. I'll put it to you that way. Right. We'll stay away from that one. Yeah. Anyway. I, I, I always tell my son, don't ask people, don't ask too many questions about the yeah. yeah. if, you, if you want to do it, just do it, but don't, uh, right. you're not going right. to, you're not going to find out too much. Um, how about your decision to go to comm school? Uh, that because you didn't get an MBA later on that ended up being a fantastic decision. Oh yeah. Well, the, I think, I mean, that's why, uh, when I thought about getting an MBA, it was just like, we did so much of that at the comm school. Like, cause I thought about going to MBA school versus law school and I just couldn't see the MBA being significantly additive, like law school would be significantly additive. I'll put it to you that way. But the decision was just because honestly, I wanted to major in accounting. I was doing doing well in accounting. I was getting good grades in accounting and I wanted to major in accounting. And so the comm school was an amazing place to do it. And I wound up getting a, a huge supporter at the comm school, this um, professor by the name of Professor Ray Hunt. And he actually was the one that helped me and several other students um, passed the CPA exam. So, I mean, it wound up being a great decision. Yeah. And like me, uh, another great decision you made was to stay in Charlottesville and go to law school. And you, did, you didn't take any time off. You went right away. You, you mentioned that by the time your, uh, your law school days were over, you're, you're ready to leave Charlottesville. And I was too. But did you enjoy the law school experience? You know, I I probably would say, um, looking back on it, yes, I did. But at the time, I would say not. No, I didn't. Were you married That's in law school? Were you married in law school? I was not. I was not. I think it was just for me. Um, I probably, in retrospect, should have taken a year or two off. I was just tired. I was just tired. I I I studied for the CPA exam in May and passed, and went to law school in August. Yeah. And I had friends who passed and now they are working and they have these jobs and those jobs look very glamorous and they're making a great paycheck. And I'm still a broke student who's yeah. studying. I was tired. I really was. I probably should have taken a break, but I also just wanted to be done with school too. Yeah. Well, well, look, Shannon, this, this is, this has been great. You've had such an amazing career. It's, it's great to see. You. And I guess I'll, uh, hopefully I'll get to see you again at uh, Black Alumni Weekend. But, but, but I did want to finish with, um, so I, I did listen to one of your interviews with an old friend of yours on, on Fox News in San Francisco, and he called you a Renaissance woman, which, which you know, we all like to be thought of as more than just a smart person, a double who, and a successful um, C-suite executive. But I, my guess is you you probably are going to have some very interesting projects for retirement. And look, I, I'm not trying to get... We need to stop. We got a long way to go here. We're, we're young people. But what kind of things would you want to do um, in, in retirement? Um, I think uh, for me uh, in retirement, I still, you know, you know, look, I've seen a lot of my role models who have retired, but they're still busy. They're still active and they're still giving back. And so this is really about like, how am I making this easier for the next generation? Mm -hmm. What am I doing? How am I opening up my networks? What am I doing to really continue to, um, the, the phrases lift as we climb, right? What am I doing to continue to do that? I think those are the projects. Those are the things that are going to be like interesting for me to be personally you know, involved in. I see myself probably being on some more boards um, maybe consulting here and there, but really investing in that next generation um, is just going to be super important to to me and and what actually gives me passion and drive. So that that's kind of what I see. It's so funny because um, what does even retirement mean? Like right? nowadays, I know what it meant for my grandfather when he retired, but what does that even mean? I know so many people who are let's say 60, 70 years old, and they're still 
they're not working a full operating job, but they're still busy doing like lots of interesting things. And so that's my hope is that I'm able to continue to do things that like I'm passionate about. And again, at the same time, helping others, if I can make it easier for the next person, um, that's what I want to do. I would think, uh, you know, with social media and the way you play the game so well, it, it could make you kind of competitive. I mean, every time I look up, you're ringing the bell at the stock exchange. I mean, you're always doing fun stuff. You know, I, I can't imagine a person like yourself all of a sudden stopping and your social media shows you at the beach for, for two, two or three weeks at a time. Yeah. I, I don't see you act, uh, operate like that. It's not, that's not, I mean, you know, you fantasize about it. Like, oh, I just want to take two, two weeks in San Tropez and just kick it. I mean, I think I probably get bored. Honestly, I probably would get too bored. So you're right. As much as I, I, I make the jokes, I'll say to my husband, I'm retiring next year. He's like, yeah, right. I, it, it won't happen. And then you'd be like Tina Turner and you'd be off back to Switzerland. So <laughs> Exactly. Uh, Which is not a bad thing, actually. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> I would love to retire in Europe if I could ever afford it. But, so, but uh, yeah. But anyway, Shannon, this, is, this has been great. Great to talk to you. And uh, you know, thanks for doing it and opening up uh, your life right. to us. Yeah, and I look forward. I guess I'll probably be seeing you in, in probably four, uh, five or six weeks. April, sometime mid-April, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can introduce our sons because they're both they're both second years. So yeah, that would be that would be cool. What's your son majoring in? He's economics, like I was. At econ, my son's doing philosophy. Oh, and, that's awesome. Um, I mean, not philosophy. My gosh, psychology. Wrong. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, my son's taking his first psychology class. He loves it. He talks about it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Remember that first psych class you take, and it's always so fascinating to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It makes you begin to overthink things. So tell yourself, <laughs> be careful. Uh, right, you know, right. Yeah. No, anyway, this is look, great. Shannon, this has been great. Uh, let's keep in touch and I, I will definitely see you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. It's been great. Thanks. Yeah.